Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Good morning. And whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary, remotely via Zoom, or watching this recording later, it's good to connect with you. By greeting our virtual neighbors, we build a bridge between online and in-person participants. First, we will project the image of all of those joining us on Zoom on our screen and ask them to turn on their cameras and give us a wave. Good morning. Now, we who are gathered here in the sanctuary will turn to face the camera in the back and give the folks a wave. Good morning. If you are visiting us for the first time, welcome. If you are with us in the sanctuary, we invite you to join us after service for coffee and conversation in Hodes Hall, which is located to the left as you exit the sanctuary. If you are with us on Zoom, we invite you to stay on the call uh, for a virtual coffee hour immediately after our service ends. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building this beloved community. The campus of Birmingham Unitarian Church occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe Council of Three Fires, Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. Bloomfield Hills is situated on land ceded in the 1807 Treaty of Detroit. We acknowledge Michigan's 12 federally recognized Native nations, as well as historic indigenous communities in Michigan. We also acknowledge indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. Here today, in this place with these people, may we listen so that we can hear, may we hear so that we can feel, may we feel so that we can know, and may we know so that we can change ourselves and the world. May this chalice we light, light our way. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit and join in singing hymn 112, Do You Hear?
listen. Can you hear it? The spirit is calling. It calls in the silence and through the noise and busyness of our daily lives. It calls us in the brightness of the day and the darkness of the night in times of hope and despair. Listen, can you hear it? The spirit is calling. It doesn't matter what you call it, for it has no name and has many different names. The spirit of life, the spirit of love, the spirit of compassion, the spirit of hope, the spirit of justice. Listen, can you hear it? The spirit is calling. It's calling to you and to me. It's calling us to greater wholeness, greater connection, greater service, greater love. It's calling us to heal the brokenness within ourselves, in others, and in the world. It's calling us to live more deeply. It's calling us to beauty. It's calling us to laugh and dance and sing. It's calling us to live through life's pain and sorrow. It's calling us to live courageously and kindly, to speak our truth in love and to bend the moral arc of the universe toward justice. It's calling us into community. It's calling us into the greater life of all. Listen, can you hear it? So today's story is called Facts versus Opinions versus Robots <laughs> by Michael Rax. So to start off, do you know the difference between a fact and an opinion? It, it can be hard to understand. Even these robots get confused. But maybe if we work together, we can figure it out. So here we have three robots. Each robot has two eyes. One robot is blue, one robot is red, and one robot is yellow. So let's review. Are there three robots? Yes. yes. Okay. Do they each have two eyes? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, do any of them have three eyes? No. No, okay. Um, is one blue? Yes. yes. Is one red? Yes. Is one yellow? Yes. yes. Is there a green robot? No. no. Oh, okay. Well, good. Excellent. These are facts. <laughs> a fact is anything that can be proven true or false. Now, let's try something a little different. Which of these robots is the most fun? <laughs> Is it the blue one? No. The red one? The yellow one? Okay, okay, so we've, we've decided the yellow one is. Well, good choice. Um, and the choice you made is an a? Opinion. opinion. Good. Now, an opinion is something that you feel and that you believe, uh, but something that you cannot prove. Opinions, though, are wonderful, and we all have them. They're what make us unique. But it's very important to know the difference between a fact and an opinion. There's only one robot here. Is that a fact or an opinion? Fact. Fact, fact okay. The robot is green. Fact or opinion? Fact. Fact, okay. Uh, green is a great color for a robot. Opinion. That's my humble opinion. I really like this green robot. But, it, you know, you guys are getting really good at this. So, let's try a hard one. Is this a big robot? Yeah. It, it could be medium. It could be small. But I think I heard it. 
So without any other robots to compare, we don't know if it's big, medium, or small. So we must wait until we have more information. Now, here come a few more robots, right? So now we have some more information. Now, turning back to our green robot, is it the biggest or is it the smallest? No. It's kind of medium, right? Yeah. So that is a, a fact, right? Okay, so let's, let's try some more. We're, we're getting really good. Okay. Two of these robots have square heads and one has a round head. Fact or opinion? Fact. fact. Which robot would you like to be friends with? Is that a fact or an opinion? opinion? It's an opinion. You can keep that opinion to yourself for now. <laughs> All right, so let's look at some more robots. So, okay, one robot has two arms and one robot has four arms. Fact or opinion? Fact, fact right? Because we can prove it. We can oh. count. One, two, three, four on the orange robot. One, two on the blue robot. All right, well, let's see what other robots we have with us here. Aww. Okay, so we have a new robot. What's this robot's name? Bruno. You don't know, right? Could be Bruno, it could be Buddy, it could be Bubba. <laughs> if we look closely at the picture, really closely, is there anything that proves that this robot could be named Bruno? Buddy or Bubba? No. 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 Not right now, right? So what do we do when we don't have enough information? We wait. We wait. Very good. All right. Now that we know a lot about facts and opinions, let's see if the robots understand. All right. So we have a little conversation here. I want ice cream. Me too. My favorite flavor is chocolate. Mine is pistachio. Ew, you're wrong. Chocolate is the best. I'm not wrong. I like pistachio. Yuck, pistachio is nasty. Well, chocolate is gross. So, is having a favorite flavor a fact or an opinion? It's an opinion, right? And these robots sure have some strong opinions. Though, to be fair, for some humans, they may not be able to enjoy chocolate or pistachios or even ice cream at all. And because those flavors could be harmful to our bodies. So it could be considered a fact to them to say that those flavors are gross. You know, there's a little bit of gray area. That's what we're figuring out today, right? All right, so. <laughs> Are these robots fighting? Yes. I think it's safe to say that's a fact, right? All right, well, let's repair the robots and see if they can do better. I want ice cream. Me too. Yum, my favorite flavor is chocolate. Mmm, mine is pistachio. I like oil on my ice cream. I like nuts and bolts on mine. See how it helps to listen to each other's opinions? Here are two more robots. Let's see what's going on with them. Scary movies are the best. I like cute movies with puppies. Don't be a baby. Watching a, we're watching a scary movie. Ooh, no, please turn it off. So is the blue robot being a good friend? Not really, right? And by ignoring the opinions of others, we can hurt their feelings. So maybe the blue robot needs to be rebooted. <laughs> and we'll push the button to reboot them. All right, so let's try that again, shall we? So you don't like scary movies. I don't like cute puppy movies, so do you like space movies? Yes, I do, I love space movies. Well, yeah, let's watch a space movie now. I hope there aren't, any, there aren't too many nasty humans in it. 
Josh. <laughs> Yay, good. So that reboot must have worked. Now, let's see who's coming back into the fold. Remember, remember a robot from earlier? They brought some popcorn, apparently. Now, earlier, we wanted to know this robot's name, and I threw out some suggestions, right? If it was Bruno, or maybe it was Buddy, or Bubba. But, what's this robot's name? Bubba. Bubba, Bubba right, and how do we know? It says right there, they're wearing a name tag, like most of you are, good job. So now we all know what your name is. So that is a fact, we know, because we can tell right there from Bubba's name tag. So these robots have figured out quite a lot, and so have we. You see, when we respect the opinions of others, we can all get along. Now that we know the difference between facts and opinions, it's important to remember that while we try not to argue about opinions, we can't really argue with facts. Now, we've come to the end of our story. Was it an awesome one? Yes. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. So I, I appreciate that opinion, but if you want, you can go back and listen to it again later on YouTube, and that is a fact. fact. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> All right, and now we are going to have our children and youth meet us at the back of the sanctuary as we head off to class. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in the community. The recipient of our plate shared in October is the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition. We'll see a video now that describes their work. It's okay. The Michigan Environmental Justice Co Coalition works to achieve a clean, healthy, and safe environment for Michigan residents most affected by inadequate policies. Since its founding in 2011, a lot has happened. Detroit water shutoffs and bankruptcy, the Flint water crisis, fast tracking of air pollution and mining permits, fracking, new and aging pipelines, and more. In response, MEJC began growing its network and membership. Every two years, MEJC hosts the Environmental Justice Summit, has three research projects with the University of Michigan, does on-the-ground community education, and meets with federal, state, and local governments to move the needle on environmental justice. They take a multifaceted approach to, system ch to systems change by aligning on intersectional goals 
with statewide power building organizations and small grassroots groups for policy change and disruption. Their organization operates within an understanding that the root causes of climate change are racism, capitalism, and the heteropatriarchy with the impact of those oppressive systems falling on BIPOC and low-income communities. The Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition builds power and unity so all can thrive. This morning's offering will now be given and received in a spirit of generosity and gratitude. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and of the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition. We hold each other in our hearts and minds with all our joys and all our sorrows. The joys and sorrows of the congregation that are shared with us this morning are these. From Larry Friedman, a joy. Yvonne Verschuren had to cancel the chemo treatment for her lymphatic cancer after four sessions because of severe side effects. However, a subsequent MRI and exploratory surgery revealed that the cancer had disappeared. She feels much better and is receiving radiation and medications for healing and preventive purposes. From Keith and Mary Ensroth, please keep our niece and her family in your thoughts and prayers. They live in North Carolina, just east of Asheville, and their property and livelihood have been devastated by Hurricane Helene. We remember those experiencing losses and those facing health challenges. As we approach the anniversary of attacks by Hamas on Israel on October 7th of last year, setting off waves of retaliation and conflict, we pray for the people of Israel we pray for the people of Palestine. We pray for the people of Lebanon. We pray for lives lost and lives shattered. We pray for all those affected by war and threats of war in the Middle East. We pray in whatever way we pray 
for all those affected by war, by hatred and violence. We pray for peace. We pray for the people of North Carolina and other parts of the southeastern United States affected by devastating flooding in the wake of Hurricane Helene, for lives lost and homes destroyed. Even when the cares of the world weigh on us, may we find joy in our connections with each other and in the pleasures that life <clears throat> holds. Let us care for one another and for ourselves in all the ways we can. As we hold each other in our hearts and minds with all our joys and all our sorrows, let's take a moment to be quiet together. you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others made may prevail in the world, and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. For there is, a, there is many a small betrayal in the mind, a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break, <coughs> sending with shouts the horrible errors of childhood storming out to play through the broken dike. And as elephants parade, holding each elephant's tail, but if one, wanders the if one wanders, the circus won't find the park. I call it cruel, and maybe the root of all cruelty, to know what occurs but not recognize the fact. And so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, important region in all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes or no or maybe, should be clear, the darkness around us is deep. When someone deeply listens to you, it's like holding out a dented cup you've had since childhood and watching it fill up with cold, fresh water. When it balances on the brim, 
you are understood. When it overflows and touches your skin, you are loved. When someone deeply listens to you, the room where you stay starts a new life and the place where you wrote your first poem begins to glow in your mind's eye. It's as if gold has been discovered. When someone deeply listens to you, your bare feet on the earth and a beloved land that seemed distant is now at home within you. For children, it's important to learn the distinction between facts and opinions. After my grandsons, Oliver, age seven, and Avery, age eight, read the book Facts versus Opinions with Robots together with me, they seemed to understand the difference. It was useful to ask them, is that an opinion or a fact, when they were arguing about which video game character is best and had been using, I'm right and you're wrong, as their reasons. That's a pretty good start. As life gets more complicated, it's not as simple as the concept that facts are objective and opinions are subjective. Bias enters into the equation. 
as our experiences and other influence skew our points of view. <coughs> our biases affect how we form opinions about facts. And of course, we really can argue about facts, can't we? We are all biased, and bias can be a useful tool to help us see patterns and process information. But bias can become insidious when we don't recognize it in ourselves or others. Facts are facts. But what is the source of the facts that are presented? Is our source truly reliable? Which facts do we focus on? Which facts are left out of the histories we read? Is our truth selective? The book Facts Versus Opinions suggests that when we respect the opinions of others, we can all get along. It's not so hard to recognize that everyone is entitled to their opinions, even if we find those opinions are things we fundamentally disagree with. We may not be able to find common ground in our ideas or our ideology. How do we truly hear each other when we hear with different ears? Sometimes we just need to be still and listen. What if our only common ground is our common humanity? A blogger named Benjamin Mathis suggests that the way to listen when you disagree is to work to hear the person, not just the opinion. He acknowledges that it takes a lot of forgiveness, compassion, patience, and courage to listen in the face of disagreement. And he suggests that when someone has a point of view we find difficult to understand, disagreeable, or even offensive, we must look to the set of circumstances that person has experienced that resulted in that point of view. Get their story, their biography, he says, and you'll open up the real possibility of an understanding that tr transcends disagreement. He suggests when you find yourself in disagreement, ask one question. Will you tell me your story? I'd love to know how you came to that point of view. Can we listen with curiosity? Can we listen with the possibility, with openness to the possibility of changing our minds and changing our hearts? Changing our minds may require agreement, which we may not be able to find. But changing our hearts only requires understanding. Valerie Carr, founder of the Revolutionary Love Project, whose mission includes listening across differences, notes that it turns out it is extremely difficult to draw close to someone you find absolutely abhorrent. <laughs> How do we listen to someone when their beliefs are disgusting or enraging or terrifying? An invisible wall forms between us and them, a chasm that seems impossible to cross. We don't even know why we should try to cross it, she says. In these moments, we can choose to remember that the goal of listening is not to feel empathy for our opponents or validate their ideas or even change their mind in the moment. Our goal is to understand them. When listening gets hard, Carr says, I focus on taking the next breath. I pay attention to sensations in my body, heat clenching, and constriction. I feel the ground beneath my feet. Am I safe? If so, I stay and slow my breath again, quiet my mind, and release the pressure that pushes me to defend my position. I try to wonder about this person's story and the possible wound in them. I think of an earnest question and try to stay curious long enough to be changed by what I hear. Maybe, just maybe, my <coughs> opponent will begin to wonder about me in return, ask me questions, start, 
listen to, and listen to my story. Maybe their view will start to break apart and new horizons will open in the process. Then again, maybe not. It doesn't matter as long as the primary goal of listening is to deepen my own understanding. Listening does not grant the other side legitimacy. It grants them humanity and preserves our own. Perhaps a version of that happened here last Sunday at the Circle Conversation on Justice in the Middle East. Unfortunately, I was unable to attend, but Sarah Redman gave me a description of her experience. The room was full of emotion and angst for everyone in varying degrees. I doubt anyone came away with a different position, but we all had a chance to clarify and understand why we feel the way we do, and that's a huge beginning. The darkness around us is deep, in the words of William Stafford. It's up to us to do what we can to shine a light in the dark places. When we deeply listen to each other, we open the possibility of hearing each other into speech. When someone deeply listens to us, we can find our voice. Feminist theologian Nell Morton's 1977 essay, Beloved Image, in her book, The Journey is Home, explained the origin and meaning of her phrase, hearing each other into speech. It was in a small group of women who had come together to tell our own stories that I first received a totally new understanding, that I first, sorry, a totally new understanding of hearing and speaking. I remember well how one woman started hesitating and awkward. Finally, she said, I hurt. I hurt all over. She talked on and on. Her story took on a fantastic coherence. When she reached a point of most excruciating pain, no one moved. No one interrupted. Finally, she finished. After a silence, she looked from one woman to another, and she said, you heard me. You heard me all the way. Her eyes narrowed. She looked directly at each woman in turn and then said slowly, I have a strange feeling you heard me before I started. You heard me to my own story. Morton continues, this woman was saying, and I had experienced a depth hearing that takes place before the speaking, a hearing that is far more than acute listening, a hearing engaged in by the whole body that evokes speech, a new speech, a new creation. The woman had been heard to her own speech. In the context of the 1970s women's liberation movement, Morton wrote, Hearing of this sort is equivalent to empowerment. We empower one another by hearing the other to speech. We empower the disinherited, the outsider, as we are able to hear them name in their own way, their own oppression and suffering. In turn, we are empowered as we can put ourselves in a position to be heard by the disinherited to speaking our own feeling of a sense of being caught and trapped. Hearing in this sense can break through political and social structures and image a new system, a great ear in the heart of the universe, at the heart of our common life. Hearing human beings to speech, to our own speech. What application does this have to our lives today? When we recognize each other's and our own
humanity beneath our divisions and differences. Perhaps we can use our new understandings to help us find and work towards solutions that break through political and social structures and image a new system. As the poet William Stafford reminded us, the darkness around us is deep. What can we do to shine a light into the dark places? I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit and join in singing hymn 354, We Laugh, We Cry. <laughs> extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. May we live our lives fully and creatively so that we may be a blessing to ourselves, to each other, and to all those whose lives we touch. And now I invite you to remain seated and still during the postlude taking a few moments for quiet contemplation as the music plays before we greet each other after the service. <laughs> 